Hello everyone, welcome to episode 10 of the Soccer 60 podcast brought to you by Little League um, For those who have not listened to us yet, you should But for those who are still new, uh, welcome And uh, we are going to let you know what Soccer 60 is about So Soccer 60 is a youth football podcast where we bring coaches and those in the industry to good to get to know them more and to dissect more about the industry as a whole. Now, towards the end of the show, we'll be answering some of your questions from you, the listeners, and you have to make sure that you send your questions into our social media platforms, which is at Little League Soccer MY on both Facebook and Instagram. Joining us today is the usual culprits, myself, Henry Chu, Andy Johnston, and for today, head coach of the Little League Under Sixes and FC Kuala Lumpur Under Sevens, Kiro Nazrin. Hi, Andy and Nas. Um, so we've been on a break for a while So I'd like to know how you guys have been doing For the past month Been doing good Studying, self-studying Always trying to improve myself Even mm-hmm. when we're not doing much That is, I mean, uh, that is expected For <laughs> me it's, it's been a, a, a bit of a whirlwind um, Obviously we were extremely busy During the MCO um, In different ways to what we, mm-hmm. what we used to but now we've come back out onto the pitch and into regular training again. It, it's it's busy in a whole new different set of circumstances. Uh, it's obviously been very nice to get back out onto the pitch, um, and uh, yeah, it's been it's been great to just kind of resume training and start playing some matches again with the kids. So that's been good. Yeah, it's been really, really good to see football back on the pitch again. Uh, now, as usual, let's get crack on. To the actually don't let's not crack on to the main agenda. This is just the part where I fluff up the introduction as usual. Uh, Andy, why don't you do a little bit of a housekeeping for the people who are listening and what they're expecting for Little League this month? Yeah, first of all, thanks Henry for the fluff introduction. Uh, it wouldn't be a Soccer <laughs> Sixty podcast without that, so thank you. Um, obviously, it's been a while, as you mentioned, since we've done a Soccer 60 podcast, so it's nice to be back. Um, since the last recording, a lot has changed. We've actually managed to resume outdoor training. So that's the big news for, for Little League this week, is that we are back out onto the field. Training has resumed. Um, some slight differences. Uh, we've been able to open three of our four training centers. Uh, the fourth training center in Melawati, unfortunately, is unable to open at the moment due to the restrictions of the, the training venue there. So uh, three of the four venues are back open. It's resumed in small kind of groups. We've got a limit of 10 players to every one coach that we send. So you're getting even more indiv- individualized and personal training sessions. Um, I think uh, people are slowly getting used to coming back out onto the field. We, we're starting to see more and more return back to action so that's really nice to see and I'm sure those that have been involved so far have thoroughly enjoyed it. Um, We are introducing next month for the first time a return to our topic of the month. Um, Before the MCO hit we had started doing uh, a regular topic each month and we had done passing and we had done ball mastery so the month of September is going to be introducing and concentrating on shooting which is most kids' favorite subject, so I'm sure it's going to be a fun month of of football for them. Um, We've introduced a a special monthly pass, so for the past uh, six six weeks or so that we've been running training, uh, sign-ups have been on a per-session basis, um, but now we have been able to put ourselves into a position where we can now sell a a monthly pass. It's 150 ringgit for eight sessions of, of training, Saturday and Sunday mornings. And uh, we're offering a very special promotion for anybody listening to this podcast. You can use the promo code SOCCER60 at the checkout at our website uh, and you get a further 10 ringgit discount, um, which I think actually brings the cost of each training down to about 18 ringgit per session. So uh, thoroughly worth the money. Like I said, it's a maximum ratio of 10 students to one coach. Um, which is a pretty pretty unique situation to be able to benefit from. So do do give that a try and get down to our weekend sessions, uh, 8 to 9 a.m. or 9 to 10 a.m., depending on how old you are. Um, and that's that's really the big news for, for Little League. Um, as far as FCKO is concerned, we've had the last two weekends, we've been able to return to uh, action in the, in the Air Asia Junior League. Um, and we can... Uh, I'm happy to say that we've had some fantastic results in those first two weeks of uh, Mm -hmm. the resumption of the league. Um, I think that pays uh, tribute to the fact that we continued uh, hard training over the MCO. The coaches did great work with their teams, um, made sure that everybody 
kept their fitness levels up as best as they possibly could. And I think that we've seen that pay dividend um, once the league has returned, uh, especially against some other teams that maybe weren't uh, as fortunate as us to be able to have the facilities that we do and, and maybe weren't able to continue training throughout the, the MCO period. So I think we, we've seen that uh, pay off in, uh, in a lot of ways. Uh, so that's great and we'll look forward, to, I think most teams are on break this weekend with the long weekend, um, but we'll look forward to resuming that again the following weekend and, and enjoy finishing mm. off the season in the next couple of weeks. So that's about all the news for, right. from us. Um, if you want mm -hmm. any more information about that, you can log on to our website, littleleague.my, um, and don't forget to sign up for this weekend's training sessions. And that's right. Uh, for those who are looking forward to FC Kuala Lumpur content as well, you can go to www.fckualalumpur.com. Uh, now, we go on to our show. And as usual, I love doing this. Uh, I love picking on uh, our guests on what they wear for the show. And today, Nazrin has a unique um, Argentina shirt on. Well, it's not really unique, but it must have a story behind it. So, Naz, why don't you tell us the story? Alright, so uh, this jersey means a real lot to me because it's actually my first ever football jersey that I got. So this uh, jersey is over 20 years old, uh, about 20, 22 years old. Uh, so it's quite old. And uh, it's special because like, obviously it's the, my first jersey and also there's a story, interesting story that I shared to you guys previously for those who heard. Um, I once wear this jersey to Rivaldo's house when I was going to Rivaldo's house in Uzbekistan. So is, uh, Rivaldo is obviously Brazilian and Brazilians are uh, rivals with Argentinians. So the moment I stepped into the house, uh, the house compound, all of his workers and mates started looking at me. It's like they're looking at me, staring at me. And then one of them spoke in Portuguese to my best friend, uh, who's the godson of Rivaldo. They said, tell him to Take off that shirt so we can we uh, we can burn it and then we can give him a new Brazilian shirt. <laughs> but you you so I'm assuming that, that you, you didn't get the. No, I'm not taking it off. <laughs> no, I'm not taking it off because uh, it means a lot to me the jersey. <laughs> so I know I didn't take it off, but yeah, they gave me a they gave me a stare for wearing the Argentinian jerseys. Like, how dare you wear Argentinian jersey? <laughs> To a and that's, when, I, when I saw you log on this morning, I was surprised to see you in an Argentina shirt because I always um, imagined you as a Brazilian fan. So, but are no. you still an Argentinian fan to this day? Or Argentina uh, holds a place uh, in my heart because it was the first country that I lived in outside of Malaysia. So, my dad is a diplomat. I go wherever he goes, uh, which country he goes. So, the first country that we went to outside of Malaysia was Argentina. And I moved there when I was one years old and then stayed there until I was five. Mm. Yeah. So, um, actually, I had this question set for later into your introduction. But now that you've brought it up, I think it's a question that all the coaches and myself want to know. How mm -hmm. do you know Rivaldo? Okay. Um, so, I don't personally know him as if, as if he is my <laughs> friend. Um, I knew him. I know him from my best friend, who is the godson of Rivaldo. So, um, Rivaldo uh, lived in Uzbekistan when in two thousand eight, two thousand nine, because he was playing for a club there, Bunyat Kuro FC. So during that time, they had an ambitious project. They brought in some crazy names to in Uzbekistan. It's like, what the heck is going on in Uzbekistan? Players like Rivaldo coming into the club, and then they got. Philip Scolari, also a World Cup winning coach, coming to the coming to the club to manage the club is is something that is like doesn't happen usual usual thing to happen in Uzbekistan, like a country where not a lot of people know at that time. To be honest, I didn't know what Uzbekistan was when I was younger. Um, so to know the country like Uzbekistan having place like Rivaldo and a manager like Philip Scolari in a club. It's a crazy thing, and the monies involved in those deals were also crazy. All right. Uh, yeah. Now that we know just a little bit of uh, the story behind Rivaldo, um, mm -hmm. let's get kicking. Let's get cracking into Nazrin's story. So, Nazrin, why don't you give us a brief background on yourself and how you got yourself into football? Okay, uh, how I got myself into football? Well, regarding playing, I've started playing. Uh, since I was young, 
um, when I was a kid, I started playing football. That's normal for kids. But regarding coaching wise, I started coaching when I was 16 years old. Um, and this is because in my school, we had a leadership program where the athletic director picked um, exemplary athletes uh, from the older age group to coach the younger age group. So I was 16 years old. I was, um, they volunteered, they picked me as one of the coaches, uh, one of the athletes um, who show exemplary attitudes toward younger players. So they, they picked me and then um, we had a project where we had to teach, um, I think, seven-year-old, six-year-old to play football. So that was the first time I got involved in coaching. And from there on, I, I knew I wanted to um, manage football. I mean, like, I, I either wanted to play football as a professional player, and if I didn't make it, uh, I knew my option was to become a football coach, which is why for my university degree, uh, I took sports science because I knew that Euron Klopp and Jose Mourinho did sports science for their degree, so I, had, I applied in, adva in advance that I knew I wanted to do the same thing because that's a pathway for me. Now, so we, we mm. skip forward a little bit in, in, your, in your life there, um, but okay. we've had a few interesting discussions with, with previous coaches on here about their first uh, experience of playing football and in what kind of setting was that. Like, which, which country were you in when you first started playing football and, and what was that, in what kind of format was it? Was it an organized club or was it kickabouts with your friends? How did it, that kind of evolve? Okay, so when I started playing football, it was uh, just playing at my school. I wanted to play for like an academy, but at the time my, my parents were always busy, so they didn't have time to send me uh, to academies, which I think the kids in our club are very privileged to have this opportunity to train at the club because that was one of my um, one of the one thing I wanted to do when I was younger to train in an academy but I couldn't have that uh, opportunity so the only way I got better by playing football was playing street football whenever I met people I, I, uh, I, I went to the park played with random people and usually we we played against older kids so as a young kid when you play against y the older guys you you start to I think you get better as a player playing with older guys rather than playing uh, with the kids your age. So that's which, how I got which involved. Which country or countries were you playing these pickup games in? Oh, uh, so mostly it was uh, in Uzbekistan. That's when football started to bloom like crazy for me. So because maybe the, uh, partly because of the influence of the Brazilians coming to Uzbekistan. So every almost every day I would say after school. Uh, We'll go home and then I'll, I'll text my friends, um, my best friends that guys, let's get ready to play football. So then me, uh, me and my brother will ride bicycle, pick them up and then we'll go to the park together and play together. So uh, that's how we got involved playing. And uh, excuse my games. ignorance, but I'm sure there's a, there'll be a lot of people listening to this that are also in the same situation as me that don't understand much about Uzbekistan economics and the, the, the lay of the land there like are parks a common thing there was it very easy to get to parks or was there was there football goals at these parks was the were the fields in good conditions uh, what was it like so uh, the park is um, it was not really good condition we had to play on like um, like a, it's a tennis court makeshift into a football field so uh, and then at the end of the tennis court, there's like um, the metal nets so to prevent ball from going out. So we'll use one of those grids as a small goal. So it's more like a street football format. Mm -hmm. And then we'll, we will be playing against uh, the other players from other clubs. Like most of the kids that goes to the park to play there are kids from clubs. So um, it was interesting. It was a good learning experience so for me to play against those guys. How do you compare that kind of environment where you kind of honed your skills as a footballer versus the environment that uh, we are coaching our young children on now where they're coming down to 4G AstroTurf pitches with mm. floodlights and uh, age-appropriate sized goalposts? How, how do you mm. think it compares? Um, yeah, um, how it compares, I would say the, the pressure it have on kids uh, is different for example when we are coaching most of the time we are we as coaches are involved uh, we are making uh, we're commenting regarding the players how they are playing uh, we're telling them what to do we're 
making them more aware. Whereas in street football, it's all about the kids. It's all about their learning process. They learn what they have to do. They learn through trial and error. So, um, and it's more small sided. So, for example, if if we are like my under sevens, we play in a seven aside format. Whereas in that street football, we will be playing in a five aside format or three versus three even, depending on how many plays uh, come to the park. But usually it's about five. And maximum. what do you think in terms of uh, the effect it has on like technical skills? Because there's mm. arguments in on both sides of this. Like uh, one mm. one argument is that if you're on a nicely conditioned football pitch where the ball runs perfectly every time, that it gives you mm. more opportunity to practice your technique and perfect it. The other mm. side of the argument is that if you're learning and playing on a on a rough surface where the ball bobbles and bounces all over the place, mm. that it it perfects your your um, reaction time and controlling mm. uh, different differently bouncing balls and stuff. What's your kind of perception as to how that affects young children growing up? Do you think? Um, so regarding that, so I think the field that I was playing in wasn't so bad as if there's like many holes in it. It was. It was not as smooth as our artificial grass in um, our fields, but it was more like a more like a uh, street asphalt, but then painted with or coated with um, thick layer of paint. So there's still some bumpy, uh, small bumpy rocks uh, under underneath it, but uh, most of the time the surface is more smooth, um, so it doesn't have that much effect. But regarding your question. Um, regarding how it develops player, I think both has the pros and cons, uh, as you said. So when you train in academy, you get to practice your technical or even tactical stuff. But whereas when you play in the streets, it's your creativity and bravery uh, regarding um, to become a creative player, to do unpredictable things that um, that is beneficial for players to have in when you're playing football, especially if you're an attacking player. Right. Um, that actually transitions us really well into the next topic, which is going to be about coaching the younger age. Now, um, Nas, you with FC Kuala Lumpur and also Little League, you started off with an age group that was, I would say, a middle of the pack. You know, uh, we, mm. we play seven the sides, nine the sides, 11 the sides. That's the main yeah. formats that we usually play with in the leagues and also how we practice. Then you transition into the older age group. And now you're n- with the youngest age group. We will, d- we will dissect a bit more about uh, that transition. But mm. now that you're with the younger age group, um, how are you coping with them? Are you, how, how do you feel like you are coping with the coaching of the younger age group? Uh... Obviously, the approach has to be different in regarding how you conduct yourself. You have to be, you have to be less serious. You have to be more friendly. You have to be more funny so that the players are more engaged. Because kids, or the younger kids, their attention span is very short. So if you start talking too much, they'll start ignoring you. So you have to always get them engaged uh, through being funny or showing ex- physical examples rather than talking. So. Uh, there are differences, and I'm currently I'm coping okay with it. Uh, what would you consider the plus points that you have experienced coaching the under sixes and the sevens lately? So the plus points is um, I get to become better as a coach regarding knowing how to teach more towards individuals rather than groups or team. For example, when I was working with the under nine, so under eleven, oh no, under nine, eleven. I mean, nine aside and eleven aside, nine aside, eleven aside. You are focusing more towards a group. For example, the defensive group, or the midfield group, or the attacking group. So, whereas the younger age group, you're focusing more towards the individual within that group. So you're teaching them the fundamentals uh, of regarding the positioning. So you're not really coaching. The team, you're coaching individuals of uh, what they have to do in their role rather than working as a group because mm. um, you try to develop individual players in this age group. You're not really building a team because the younger age group, you create players that are more uh, technically and tactically ready for the older age group when they, get, uh, when they get passed on to other coaches in the future. So they have more players that are ready-made to be coached regarding more complex stuff rather than the simple stuff. 
Now, Andy, um, when when I first started with Little League, uh, I knew you as a coach that is very close to the younger kids, and you still are to me. Um, what would you? What would be your input in terms of the plus points that you have experienced with the younger age groups? Would you vibe? Would would you would you have the same vein with uh, Nazrin on this? Yeah, I mean, like for for me personally, uh, I've always um, had that closer connection to younger kids. It's it's where I. Uh, prefer to work uh, it's what's enjoyable for me like I enjoy seeing um, those kind of penny drop moments where some, something suddenly clicks for kids that you've been working on for a long time and then all of it just comes together and they, they have a kind of breakthrough moment as you get older up the age groups that, that happens less and less and it becomes more about um, as Nazrin has said there the, the, the tactical side of it um, the outthinking the opponents the adjusting what happens on the field uh, that's, that's never been my strength and, and we have coaches in the, in the academy now that are far better than me at doing that and reading the game and making adjustments and outthinking uh, opponents strategies and stuff like that um, so that's, that's, that's not where I can apply strengths I don't think so you know we, we bring in people that, that do have that good understanding to do that kind of job uh, for me it, it's it's working with the younger age groups is uh, as Nazun has said that very much like personal touch you're going to be working with individual players um, if you have a group of 10 to 15 players of age six and seven none of those are going to react the same way to your coaching style you have to adjust a little bit mm. to, to each one um, I think Naz has been uh, um, very sort of humble when he's talked about his success with the U7s. I think it's been a fantastic placement for him and I think he's done a great job there. And I think that the main reason for that is something that a lot of people overlook and that is uh, preparation. Um, so obviously as a coach you have to prepare an awful lot before you get into training sessions. But I think it is far more important for the younger age groups than it is the older age groups. Not Not saying that preparation is not important for the older age groups of course it is but when you sit down and prepare a session for a group of under 14s for example um, you know what they're capable of you know the drills that you can plan you know what you're going to work on and most likely it's going to run according to plan when you're working with mm. under sevens under eights under sixes whatever it may be that younger age group there is a good chance that what you have planned doesn't work out how you envisage it envisaged it yeah. and when that happens you can't just bumble through it and carry on you have to have a plan b uh, and anytime i i do a session for for really young kids um, i always think in my head right what if they can't do this what's my fallback where i don't have to completely stop the session i can just slightly adjust it and uh, and and you do that throughout coaching you know if, if a group of kids is finding something hard uh, you, you bring the, the level back down a little bit or if it's too easy you progress it for them you do that throughout coaching but for the young kids especially it's even more important and I'm sure Naz would be mm. the first person to accept that he is very much a thinker uh, in the game he, he likes mm. to think a lot and I think that that has helped a lot with the, the U7 age group and you know he analyzes right. uh, in great detail what does work what doesn't work and then you slowly get to get to know what's what's going on and, and what's going to work in future sessions so for me that's always been the enjoyable part of coaching is seeing those young kids just just have like that eureka breakthrough moment um, and it's what I what I work towards um, and and I just I just like seeing those like rapid developments from from young kids and that's that's my personal wheelhouse um, where I can mm. add a lot of value I think um, so that's that's what I enjoy doing, and and uh, you know I think Naz has, has enjoyed it similarly as well. Yeah, mm. and and over here as well, you pointed out something that we all kind of acknowledge as well that um, Nazrin being a thinker, he is known in the office, uh, in the staff room, as the tactician, the analyst. Now, this obviously applies to the older age groups where. It will help them a lot with the younger age groups who are more focused on development how have you managed to put in your favorite things like tactics analyzing into a younger age group setting nice okay so tactics uh, can be split into different categories as i said just now they can be tactics team tactics group tactics and individual tactics 
team is obviously the whole group i mean the whole team working together group is depending on whether you're a defender group of defenders group of midfielders or group of strikers if you're playing with multiple strikers and then there's the tactics for individuals so this is more regarding decision making so uh i think this is a thing that a lot of coaches uh, underestimate uh, regarding decision making uh, in football so because in football decision making is football is decision making execution of the thing is a, a when you do a technique is the execution of a decision when you think of something for example if you see a teammate you, you make a decision that you want to pass to him so the technique is just the execution of your decision so the important thing is players needs to be able to make the right decisions um, at the right time at the right place so we teach them uh, at least i teach them how to make better decisions and then based, uh, if they are their technical deficiencies then we try to improve the technical deficiency but the main priority is they should be able to make the right decisions as uh, so we can see for example right now i'm working with my players uh, the, the things that we've worked on so far this season or this year uh, 2v1s uh, if you have the ball and you have a teammate open if the defender goes to you what's your decision is it better to dribble past that defender or would you pass it to a teammate who's open so that that simple is individual small very small uh, numbers of uh, players involved over there so it's between you as a player and the ball and a teammate without the ball and also a defender so you you make a decision based on the, the defender's positioning you either pass it or you try to dribble it so if you're smart then i'll ask them questions so what was what, what is the better decision and then most of the players since they've been with me they can answer the right uh, they can answer the right question uh, i mean they can answer the question correctly and that's what you want to see so it gets them to be thinking players um, they become smarter players so uh, i think it's very important to have that decision making involved in even at the young age group uh, so it's not always technical because if they have the technical they don't know what to do with it then it's no point for me i see it is mm. you need to know what to do and then if you're not able to do it because you have technical deficiency then you can improve your technical deficiency but you need to be able to make the right decisions that's my my mm. point of view i i love i love that I answer see. from naz there and it, it fits entirely in into our club philosophy with what we're trying to to achieve and you know there, there'll be a lot of coaches out there at, uh, seven years old, they, they get tempted to tell the kids exactly what to do. Um, whereas what Naz has mm. described there is is educating them to be decision makers from a very young age is extremely important. Um, so that's fantastic. And I think that uh, one thing that Naz hasn't touched on there is also about the psychology. Um, you know, they're seven years old. To talk about sports psychology might sound a bit extreme, but there is an awful mm -hmm. lot of psychology that comes into the game at that age uh, in terms of what the coach has encourages them to do what kind of praise he gives them what kind of feedback he gives them when there's mistakes made and i think that's something that, that nas has done quite well and i think that that comes down to um, uh, tactics of your coaching not necessarily the tactics of what you're employing in an under sevens game because let's be realistic yep. there's very little tactics you're going to employ uh, in an under sevens game um, but the tactics mm -hmm. that you employ as a coach to relay the message to the kids and i think that's really important so Naz as a tactician, whether he knows it or not, has probably gone and um, strategized how best to get his message across to these under sevens. And, and that's where that kind of tactics comes into it for me. Right, right. Uh, Andy brought up an interesting observation when you coach your under seven FC Kuala Lumpur sessions. Now on Wednesdays, mm. you split them to different teams, yeah. right? And you just have them play football and you yeah. don't manage them. You, you don't manage them at all but you let the kids manage themselves during this period of play uh, yeah what is that rationale behind that and why do you think it's such an essential part of your session for the kids um so the reason why i did this the 3v3 format every wednesday so it's a 3v3 format whereas in the league our under seven boys they play in a 7v7 league uh 7v7 format the reason why i do 3v3 is because it gets the player more involved if there's three players against three players you are more likely to receive the ball and make a decision on the ball um rather than playing seven aside format where you will not get the ball all the time um so regarding um why i don't coach them during this uh, period is because i want to observe 
the the application of the things that we learn in training sessions. So if we have a topic that we worked on for the past two weeks, and then we have this tournament every week, every Wednesday, we I try to see whether the players improve in their decision making. So I note down on my uh, I have a small notebook when I train with the players. I note down what they could have done better. I mean, if I see a mistake that is common among all teams, so I put down as, an, uh, as a note that, okay, we can work on this in the future. And also, uh, why I don't talk to, uh, why I don't coach them uh, as often as coaches do for this format is because I want them to, to become leaders, group leaders, individual leaders in a team. Um, for example, during water breaks, after, after the match is finished, so usually, Every Wednesday, each team have five matches against different teams. So during the breaks, I will tell them to discuss with your teammates what you guys could have done better and what you guys did good. So that way, you guys are always self-aware of what is good and what is bad. So you are engraving that in your mind by just speaking to your teammates. You're trying to teach your own teammates um, and you communicate with each other and that's how you develop leadership even with these young players. If you just keep on telling them what to do, they're going to be robot players. They're going to be players who can't make decisions for themselves and they can't lead because they, they will be looking at the coach at the sideline during, during the match, in a fo formal match and say, coach, what should I do? I don't know. Okay, so no, I don't want to... Uh, you have to be the player that can think for yourself and you guys need to be able to lead yourself. Um, learn to lead. Okay, I am, I'm here to help you uh, develop that characteristic, but you should learn uh, to lead as individual players to, uh, in a group. Mm. Yeah. I managed to catch uh, one of your games um, in the KL Junior League, and I realized that once Andy uh, has brought up this observation, it clicked on me that this actually has seen some dividends being paid. So mm. kudos to you on that for that one. Uh, Andy, do you have anything you want to say about that, uh, that observation that you made? Like, what, uh, I mean, it's an observation I made because Nazrin very clearly spelt it out to the parents in his, in his WhatsApp group exactly what he was doing, why he was doing it, and what he hoped to achieve from it. And what I thought was, like, obviously I love the idea of this 3v3 mini league and the players looking after themselves and coaching themselves. That's great, right? That's exactly what, uh, what I like to see. Um, but what was even better was um, seeing the way that, that Nazrin was able to portray it to the parents group and how much the group of parents bought into the idea as well. And, and they understood what, what the reasoning behind it was. And, uh, you know, we, we have introduced a lot of ideas to the coaching team over the last 12 months about how we want young players to be coached. And, and we alluded to that with, with Naz just a, just a short while ago. Um, once we've coached, the coaches, how to deliver sessions. The next uh, challenge is educating parents on, on what we're doing and why we're doing it. Because it's all well and good the coach delivering a, a clear message in training and allowing them to make mistakes, but the minute you get into a match, I'm sure you've seen it, Henry, and the number of parents that scream and shout from the sideline, the minute their, yep. their child or someone else's child gets the ball at their feet, shoot, pass, dribble, whatever it may be, uh, mm -hmm. and, that, uh, and then all of a sudden that kid is listening to outside influence rather than what he's been practicing in training. So, you know, I, I thought the message that Naz conveyed to the parents as to why we're doing it uh, and uh, what he expects to see from them as well, because a big part of the message was uh, no, no parental input as well. You can, mm. you can encourage and, and clap for good performances, but you should not be shouting any instructions to the players. So, you know, if we, if we educate, um, coaches, if we educate the children, if we educate the parents on, on this kind of philosophy, especially at the age of seven, and by the time they get to the age of our under 10 age group, for example, they're going to understand fully uh, what is expected of them and what, and what we uh, accept as acceptable behavior. So it's, it's great mm. to start it at that age. That's right. Yeah, it is really good to start at the age for parents as well. Uh, we move on straight away to the topic of the episode. Um, I I coined um, this topic quite nicely, I feel, uh, with Nazrin's... Uh, Even if you do say so yourself. <laughs> yeah, with, yeah, with Nazrin's uh, story, with uh, his time in Little League and also FC Kuala Lumpur. So this topic uh, this week would be the coaching journeyman. Uh, Naz, you have yeah. experienced coaching 
nine the sides, eleven the sides, um, seven the sides. You making you one of the first few as well to cover almost basically all um, mm. the uh, the formats. Um, since since then, right? Um, when it comes to managing a small sided team, now that you're doing it, how is it compared to when it comes to coaching eleven the sides? So. Um, I've said it many times regarding the difference is um, regarding like how you're coaching the place and what's your primary focus. Um, when you are teaching the bigger group, you're working more towards the team. Uh, like the 11 aside format, you're working more coaching the, the team rather than individual players because you're trying to build up uh, the characteristic of the team, how the team should play. Whereas in the younger age group, like for example, the, the, the smallest formats, the seven aside, um, you would be focusing more towards individual players. Whereas nine aside, um, you would be focusing towards small group of players. For example, the, the defenders, yeah. what's their role? The midfielders, what's their role? And the attackers, what's their role? So, um, uh, yeah, so that's the biggest difference regarding how you are, uh, what are you focusing on uh, with the age group and the players um, uh, playing format. So, as I said, um, the younger age group, smaller, and then getting bigger, the focus, focus on group and then team. That's how I. That's the difference. Um, in terms of your playing styles, um, mm. would you say that you've managed to adapt really easily um, to the smaller side format? Uh, after you've learned, sorry, after you've learned uh, from the nine side, eleven sides. Um, I would say it's the opposite way. So I would not say uh, I'm applying the older stuff. Uh, to the younger kids I would say I see elements that I can take from this under 7s uh, age group and then if I coach in the under I mean 11 a side team again I would be able to apply that with the 11 a side team um, if like uh, that's that's how I see it so rather than the the bigger side to the younger side applying the older stuff to the younger stuff I see it applying the younger stuff to the older stuff because I think that's the natural progression of how it works usually. I think this is super important to talk about because um, the same way that we wouldn't expect kids to start off their first game, they go in and play 11 a side. You know, they should be starting yep. at three a side, four a side, five a side, seven a side, nine a side, 11 a side. They work their way up to that 11 a side format. And we shouldn't expect mm -hmm. it of coaches either. You know, coaches that come in new mm -hmm. to the game, they should not be thrown straight into 11 a side. In my opinion, regardless of what level of football they played at, even if they're coming from a professional football background uh, and have a very thorough understanding of how 11 a side football works, it's a completely different thing to coach it. And I, I, I strongly believe that coaches should start off at the, at the small sided formats um, because ultimately when you get up to 11 a side, uh, although there's, there's a whole lot of other um, elements going on at the same time, a lot of the time it comes down to 1v1, 2v2, 3v3 battles in small areas of the pitch before you can, yep. can expand mm. out to the rest of it. So, you know, yep. the, the fundamentals of the game start at those small-sided matches. And I believe that that's where coaches should, should start. And, you know, Nazwin came in. I believe, Naz, you started in the nine-a-side format with us, right? Yep. He started in a nine-a-side format, did well, had good success. Um, and then... He had a team that was under 12s. They were the oldest team in, in that particular age group playing nine aside. And the next year they went up and they were under 13 team playing in an under 14 league and now playing 11 aside mm. format. There's an awful lot of things mm. changing there. And one of yeah. those being that the coach, Nazrin, was coaching 11 aside football really for the first time. Right, so there's a the, mm. and, and when you put all those elements together of what's changing in the team, it becomes a very difficult scenario, and uh, and that's where I think that coaches should spend more time in those small sided games and getting to understand more, and then slowly work up the same ways that players would. Um, I think it's really important for coaches to do that as well. Mm. Yeah. Um, now, now that we've covered uh, most of that, uh, I just want an honest answer from you for this one, Naz. Um, Mm. With you starting at a bigger, uh, would Nas bigger ever side, not be honest? That's true. That's yeah. true. What are you okay, saying so, about him? So, Henry? I, so, so Nas. Okay, so I, I'll take away the word honest and say why. Why don't you give us a little bit of feedback, or why don't you okay. answer answer me this? Um, do you feel like 
coaching a seven aside after you've experienced nine aside and eleven aside and step down mm. to what you've been able to do before? Um, okay, to be honest, initially, initially I did. I feel like I am I'm, I'm not applying the stuff that I know more that can be applied to the older age group because when I go to the younger age group, I know I cannot apply it. For example, uh, concept of uh, tactical periodization, football periodization. So those are more relevant for the older age group. Um, so when I go to the younger age group, uh, age group, so I'm not applying those stuff. Um, uh, I cannot really apply it because the players have no idea and it's more towards uh, fitness concepts and injury prevention. Whereas for the young age group, you're more concerned regarding the players' um, technical, uh, technical elements and also the decision-making elements. So it's not really a thing that you can... Um, uh, apply from the older age group to the younger age group. As I said previously, you cannot I uh, I I see what I learn in the under seven is is more applicable to the things with the uh, eleven aside teams rather than eleven aside teams applying stuff to the under sevens team or the seven aside format teams. This is a subject I'd like to speak about for a little while because when we when we made the, the swap with Naz, we, we took him off of an under-13s team and then put him down to an under-7s team. Uh, I think it's fair to say Naz was, was not happy about that um, and I understand that and, and uh, you know his desire is to coach at the, the highest level he can and, and that's 11-a-side football with older, older um, teams. The reality of it is that um, he... Uh, had got himself into a situation where a lot of coaches and managers do in football where um, he was he had had a string of bad results um, he was unable to really get the group of players to turn it around for for whatever reason and this happens in football all the time he'd been working with that group of players for mm. about two years right Nas? yeah yeah so about, about, two years. about two years they've been working with the same group of players and that happens a lot in football. Sometimes you can be the best coach in the world, but after you've been working with the same group of players for a little bit of time, uh, they want something new. They want a breath of fresh air to come in and revitalize the squad and, and have slightly new, uh, different training methods. Um, and that, that's not always a, a knock on the coach. You know, you could, you could probably highlight someone like Jose Mourinho as a very good example. You know, he likes to do two, three years and then it's time for something else. Um, and, and I use that example for Naz as well. And uh, it's not to say that he's a bad coach or anything like that, but sometimes you need to freshen it up. And uh, Naz was very uh, reluctant to, to be, um, you know, in his eyes demoted down to a seven-a-side format. And even more so, he got put with the under-7 team, our youngest age group and new age group. Um, but I would hope that he would, he would realize now that it's actually done him the world of good. Uh, he's now in a situation where he can... Uh, regain some confidence like there's no there's no denying it as a coach if you go through a period where you lose game after game after game after game no matter how much you say you're focused on development and stuff like that it's a it's a bruise to the ego uh, when that happens you know you don't want to be doing that with your teams right um, and and had Nazrin been working in a professional club at that time he probably would have lost his job um, but this is one of the strengths where uh, being a private organization, we focus not just on kids' development, but also coaching development. And something that we're, we're very keen to improve as, as we go on now is that we, we want young coaches coming in who get better and don't get put in situations where they're under undue stress and, and under um, a, a, a request to win um, and things like that. We don't want that. We want coaches to develop and learn and get better. And I, I really think that um, putting Naz down to that under sevens group and, and almost a bit back to basics kind of thing has done him the world of good and I think it's made him a better coach for sure. Um, one of the requests mm. that Naz made when we did that was that he would like to uh, be an assistant for one of the 11 aside teams um, so that he still keeps his, his foot in the door there, still keeps his knowledge applicable, still keeps um, uh, giving himself a, a mental workout in that way. So yeah, we put him with um, the under-16 group uh, with technical director, Coach Gareth. And uh, I would mm -hmm. hope that he's learned a lot from that. Um, and I'm, I know Gareth put him in a couple of positions where he's led training sessions or led elements of the training sessions. And I, I think that that has been a good way to, to keep the best of both worlds in a little bit. And, um, you know, Naz has probably put himself in a position where in January when we start the new season, we'll probably be looking to, to give him maybe a second team where he can exercise his, uh, his um, more advanced techniques of coaching. 
Mm. Uh, Nas, uh, before we move on to the next segment, uh, now that we've heard what Andy has said, do you do you agree? Do you think that this experience has helped you be a better coach? That you've managed to cover most all the formats in the um, playing formats that you are provided. Yep, definitely. For me, like being with the uh, under sevens is like a refresher of um, of the things that I know in the past. For example, when I go to eleven side, I might have forgotten the the more basic elements of the game because you are focusing more towards the. Uh, the towards the team rather the individuals. Uh, so I might have uh, forgotten to to apply or to to take into consideration of the things that happen in the under seven. Mm, for example, uh, when I was coaching eleven a side eleven a side team or seven as uh, nine a side team, there were some things that uh, I felt like he should already know how to do this. He's already in this group. He's already in this under 11 aside team or 9 aside team. Uh, he should know the basics of what to do. So that that ticked me, but then I, I tried to... But now, now I'm in the under 7s. I'm thinking, okay, not everybody start playing football at the same, uh, same time and everybody has a different learning rate. So you just got to keep on engraving those... Um, those knowledge to them so they might have forgotten but you have to keep on reminding them or it, maybe if they don't know um, since they are maybe new pl- newer players so you have to remind them again so you can't you can't get uh, emotional over things that players don't know how to do because you expect them to know by that age group but you still you need as a coach I feel like being with the under sevens it taught me to be more patient to be able to if I go to 11 a side team to be to remember the individuals as well, not just the the team or the group. And that is a very good way to sign off on the topic of the episode, which is the coaching journey man, which we all know is Coach Nasrin. Now we move on to my favorite segment of the show, which is called Ask Soccer Sixty, where we take your questions for Andy and Nas. If you have any questions in our uh, for our future guests, do not hesitate to send them over on our social media platforms. All right, at Little League Soccer My, at Instagram on or Facebook. Now, first question, I I I like I like taking uh questions from our regular listeners first, which is uh, Simon Motika. Um, mm. Simon has a question for you, Nas. What okay. book are you reading right now, and why? Okay, so recently I just finished reading um. A book called Soccermatics. It's about uh, ana- um, analytics in in football. So, uh, if you guys know the movie Moneyball, is uh, is a concept where they try to apply mathematics and analyzing uh, algorithms to to sports. Um, so, so that's the book that I'm currently reading, and I'm also doing a course on on football uh, tactical analysis. So it ties in with what I'm reading with the book and also what I'm doing with the course as well. And but now since I finished that book like yesterday, I'm planning to read this book over here. I have it right over here. It's called do. Tactical Periodization. <laughs> and yeah, it's it's quite detailed. <laughs> it's more for eleven aside stuff. So not really the stuff that I can apply now with the under sevens, but who knows in the future. Henry, right. you wanna know what book right. I'm reading um, at the moment? <laughs> what? 25 bedtime nursery stories for <laughs> <laughs> not a great I'm not a great reader so so reading for me consists of reading my my little son a bedtime story before we go before he goes to bed and in the morning you ask uh, uh, Henry and Ian about what baby animals names are is That's that right <laughs> right next question comes from Mark Hughes um which coach has had the greatest influence on your style of coaching, Nas? And what message in particular do you try to inspire your players with? Is he hoping he says Coach Mark? Sorry? <laughs> Is he hoping he says Coach Mark? <laughs> I don't so, know what you're trying to get from that. <laughs> so I, I think it's... Uh, I can't say individual coaches. I don't feel that um, only individual one person, I mean, as an individual, I mean one person. I think it's a multiple of people who helped me really progress to become a coach, taking my coaching level to the next level. And the, the people are, uh, that, are, that are in this list is um, our technical director, 
uh, Gareth Davis. So he helped me a lot. I learned a lot from him uh, being his assistant. The first time I was his assistant was when me and him recently joined the club uh, back in uh, 2018. So 2018 or 2017? 2018, I think. Yeah. 18, so. Yeah. Um, I was his assistant in under 14. I learned a lot from him um, and he helped me a lot, just not, not just as, as a coach, but to, do, to become a better person as well and how you talk to the players. Like, uh, because in the past, um, I was more of a coach who was the traditional coach who was at the sideline, just screaming at the players, uh, telling them instructions of what to do. So... I guess open uh, my mind regarding how to coach differently. So you, you get to uh, develop players um, for them to make their own decisions, as I said um, throughout this uh, podcast. So making intelligent players. And then other than guess it's um, the technical director of NFDP and technical director of FAM. So those uh, the former technical director of NFDP was Coach Lin Tong Kim. So he gave me opportunity to volunteer myself to get involved with, the, with coaching, uh, helping out the under-16 national team at that time. So, well, they were under-15 at that time. So it was a very good opportunity to, uh, for me to see how things work at the higher level of um, youth football. So that, that opened my mind to the level of um, an expectation of um, how to be a better coach. So... Um, the level there is very very different the high expectations is different and you have to deal you have to handle pressure uh, much better compared to um, compared to place where you have opportunity whereas as you see what's happening over there like it's very even though they say it's not result oriented it's development oriented but if you have a uh, bad result uh, as Andy said in the professional world you can lose your you lose your job so even though coach Linton Kim lost his job he still influenced me positively in um, I learned a lot from him and the last person that um, in this list is I would say the technical director of um, FAM Peter Diru mm. so uh, the first time I got in contact with him is because I was coaching his son he was his son was in the under tw- in my under 12s um, when I when I knew um, that his son was with me, so I, I started asking him questions, started meeting with him regarding coaching methods, um, regarding what I've learned. So I'm always trying to uh, get to know the uh, latest teaching method or knowledge from these people with like um, high level, the, the technical directors. For me, I learned a lot from these technical directors, these three technical directors. Um, help me progress to become a better coach even until now mm. uh, to to follow up on that question by Mark unfortunately Mark uh, your name is not in the list of Na- from Nazrin but it's okay you can work okay. yourself up there one day one day if we do a follow up uh, episode with Nazrin he might put your name out there <laughs> uh, uh, to, to the second question from Mark uh, what message in particular do you try to inspire your players with Naz what particular message do I inspire my players with mm mm-hmm. So, um, I would say for the younger age group, it's just to to enjoy the game because um, I think Gas pointed out in his podcast or maybe he talked to other coaches, he mentioned that um, dropout rates is very high. In England, they have one of the highest participation at young age group, but then by the, turn they, uh, by the time they get to 14, they have the highest dropout rate. So, players started to lose interest in the game. So... I think it's very important to have that passion for the game, love for the game. And it also comes down to the environment and the people surrounding the players. So if you have a coach that's very result oriented, that's putting pressure on the kids, they're not going to be enjoying the experience uh, of playing football. So football becomes more forced for them. Whereas kids, they initially play football not, not to win, because they play football because they enjoy it. So the players should have that enjoyment when they play football not do, don't only think about the wins just do your best and hopefully you will win so enjoy the game mm. um, now we take questions from Instagram uh, C- oh, this is going to be a bit tough to read for me uh, CT Faisal asks what is a good criteria for a footballer at the age of 7 good criteria 
for the HF7. So HF7, I would say technical elements should be, of course, the primary concern as well uh, correlating with the decision making. So decision making, they need to be able to make the right decisions at the right time. And then based on that, um, if they have technical deficiency, then they work on their technical deficiency. So uh, not all players have the same technical deficiency. For example, one player might be good at passing, but he, not, he might not be good at shooting. Or one player is good at dribbling, he might not be good at passing. So you need to know the, uh, what is the technical deficiency. So if you know their decision making um, is already okay, so try to figure out what technical deficiency they have. So And then the players have to work to improve their technical deficiency to get better. Mm. Andy, what do you think? What is a good criteria? Um, uh, so I, I work uh, now mainly with a group even younger than that, with under fours. Um, and there's there's definitely, you know, some kids that are, are born with a natural uh, ability to, to kick a ball or to run fast or, or whatever it may be. But at the age of seven, you, you never really know who's going to go on and develop good skills, uh, good ball control. You, you never really know what work people, what uh, what work kids are going to put in between those ages of like eight to twelve? You know, if a kid goes back and yeah. practices every single night after school, by the age of twelve, you know, he could be the the most skillful player when he might not yeah. have shown it at age seven. So I think for me, at age seven, it's all about the attitude. Are they prepared to listen? Are they prepared to work hard? Um, what what? How do they react if their team concedes a goal? Um, hmm. You know, I, I see that a lot. Like, do they want to? get back and, and score a goal back or do they give up or do they get upset about it you know for me it's all about attitude at that age and, and seeing whether they they want to progress they're interested in it they're listening to what the coach is saying so for me it's less less about the technical skills yeah there's going to be mm. some kids that are, are more advanced and show a, a better natural ability but I, I don't think you can tell too much at that age yep all right, we're moving on to our last two questions now. First question is for both of you guys. Uh, Stephen Chong Six asks, "What is your favorite formation for a seven aside, seven aside football game, and why?" So let's start with Nazrin first. Nazrin, your favorite formation? Um, so, favorite formation or the philosophy of what the club? Was? No, we are going let's to go favorite formation. Right now, we right? don't Proper have time for formation. the philosophy now. Okay, yeah. so favorite formation, like, I would surface? say, if if. If I was a result-oriented coach who is not focusing so much on development, for me, it would be a 3-1-2. 3-1-2 because you get defensive security and then if you have players who can do the long ball to two strikers, and then you can score more goals from the long balls. And that's what some teams in the league do. They play with three at the back, one midfielder, two up front. So, and all they do is long ball to a tall or fast striker at front and then they, they get goal-scoring goal opportunities by just doing that. But I think in, for the development, it's not good because... All you're teaching the player is to kick long balls and hope for the fast player or the tall player to be able to header it in or just uh, put it in past a player and uh, kick to the goal. So there's not real much decision making over there. It's all about getting the ball forward as fast as you can and then get closer to the goal and scoring. It's, you don't really teach the defenders what to do on the ball. You're not teaching the midfielders to get involved in the game. It's all about the long balls if you play in that formation. Okay. Andy. Uh, if you had a seven-a-side team, what's your favorite formation? I'm a boring Englishman, so it's two-three-one <laughs> for me, uh, which is the seven-a-side equivalent of four-four-two. Um, mm -hmm. I just I, I like the balance that that gives to a team. Um, you've got two wide players that can can both attack and defend. Um, security of two players at the back that should be able to cover each other. But you know, it depends on what kind of players you have in your in your team. You know, if you were going to play a three-one-two, uh, like Naz has suggested there, you would need a, a pretty talented central midfielder to be able to control the centre of the pitch by himself. You would need uh, wingers who were prepared to get up and down the pitch uh, and be responsible for their defensive duties, not like Nazrin was last night, who <laughs> forgot what the word defending meant. Um, so it, it all depends. You know, I, generally speaking, I'm a two-three-one boring kind of coach but it depends on what kind of players you've got in your team mm -hmm. okay last question Nazrin this is going to you Kurt Hurt asks what has coaching taught coach, Naz coach Nazrin that he has taken into life outside the game sorry can you repeat that question uh, what has coaching taught you that mm. you have taken into life outside the game 
Um, what has okay? So I would say um, in dealing with people, uh, you have to be you have to be more humble, more nicer to people, um, because if as a player when your coach is always shouting at you, you wouldn't like that experience. So same thing in in the outside. If you are involved with people, you have to try to be uh, nice to people, um, not always shouting at each other. So for me, that's what I see like the the being humble and being nice elements of of my uh what i learned in football and try to apply it in real life and yeah i think that was it and that was the perfect way to end the podcast thank you so much uh nazrin for joining us today um, okay. Don't forget to give us uh, feedback Send us some questions We'd love to hear from you guys Subscribe to us on your favourite podcasting platforms And don't forget to rate us If you have any comments on how we can improve We are more than welcome to listen to your input um, Most importantly, don't forget to follow us At Little League Soccer Malaysia On our social media platforms Which is at Little League Soccer MY On both Facebook and Instagram Until next time, this has been Soccer 60 See you guys in the next episode